Okay, hi. Um, this is my first time running the show, so uh, bear with me. But um, you can pray for Olivia and Jen. I think I know Olivia is sick. I don't know if Jen is just caring for somebody who's sick or what. Um, which one is sick in her household. So um, today we have our topic is nurturing family relationships. And we have Susan Gerst here, and she is married to Fred Gerst. They've been married for 37 years. She's the mother of seven. She has one son and six daughters and a grandmother of 11. So they live on a small farm. They grow vegetables for market, and uh, she works at her daughter's store baking. So um, we are excited to have you here to speak and um, looking forward to it. So I'll go ahead and just pray to start us off, and then you can come on up. Okay. Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you so much for the time that we have this afternoon. Lord, I thank you for uh, the blessing, the privilege, the freedom we have to homeschool our children. Lord, I thank you for each of the moms here. I pray for those who are not able to make it, that you would just be with them. Lord, I pray that you would bless the time that we have together, um, that, way we, that we would just spend the time fellowshipping and edifying one another and just learning. Lord, I thank you so much for everything you've given us, the beautiful weather and all the children. Uh, Lord, I just thank you for this time. In Jesus' name, amen. There you go. <laughs> I am you can use it if you need to. Well, I have a lot of kids, though, so I guess I'm used to this. <laughs> um, I did bring a picture of my family, so I'll just prop it up here. This is me, my husband, my only begotten son, who's the oldest, who's got that terrible beard. That, you know. And then this is all of us, minus... Er, there's one grandson that is not here. He was just born. And then another one is coming in June. Exciting. Oh, how do you do this? I don't know. Just clip it on anywhere. Um, okay. Oh, okay. Like this? I'm seeing, oh, pastors do this. <laughs> okay. Hey, thanks for that introduction. And this is really an honor. Um, I wrote out a speech because I'm just not very good at just talking and trying to remember everything. So I hope you don't mind me just reading. Um, so I'm going to speak um, just a bit on my homeschooling experience. Um, six of our seven children did attend public school just for various um, years, not all the way through, and I'll explain that as we go on. Um, my oldest and only son, Carl, attended public sco school through the sixth grade. He's very recently married and will be a first-time father in June. After graduation, and I put that in quotes because none of them graduated from high school, um, he became a metal fabricator, which is just a fancy way of saying a welder. Um, he attended a trade school, which was through the company he worked for, and then he developed a suspension for these late 1960 and early 1970 Mopar cars. He established a business, sold that business to a company in Minnesota, and he now farms and has a classic car restoration business. He and his wife live on a small acreage, which was part of our family farm. Uh, my daughter, Rachel, attended public school through fifth grade. She's a mother to three girls, including twins. She lives in West Point and is a paraplanner and also an accountant for her husband's business. My daughter, Brenda, attended public school through the fifth grade. She and her husband live in rural Minneapolis, and she's a mortgage loan officer. My daughter, Rhiannon, attended public school through fourth grade. She and her husband, with their four children, moved back to Burlington from Ankeny just recently. She began a children's online homemade clothing shop and more recently transformed that business into an online um, fabric shop, which includes some of the fabric she designed herself. Um, she was my only child to attend college and she was a full-time student at Iowa State University for one year. Um, my daughter Courtney attended school through first grade. She's a stay-at-home mother caring for three children. She and her husband live in rural Minneapolis. My daughter Sydney, okay, 
She's the only one that's not married. I had her read this speech, and I said she was single, and evidently single is not single. Single does not mean unmarried. Single means you're not in a relationship. So I had to, you know, alter this. So she is not married, but she is in a relationship. <laughs> so she attended public school through kindergarten, um, and she is a personal insurance specialist and lives in Burlington. Finally, my baby, Sarah, never attended public school. She lives in Burlington. She's a new mommy, and along with her husband, um, owns the Collective Food Hub. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's just a small business in downtown Burlington, which fe features local foods and a bakery. So Fred and I are very blessed because um, our seven children and their families all live close to home. We're blessed. It's been a privilege to raise them, to watch them grow into productive, respectful, dependable adults, and to think they were homeschooled. Um, my homeschool journey began nearly 25 years ago. It's a journey I thoroughly enjoyed. Um, I was what you were, would call a very relaxed teacher. It did not start that way, but I quickly learned that my children needed homeschooled, not public school at home, and there is a difference. I um, concentrated on teaching math, reading, and spelling. The curriculum I used was um, Saxon math, easy grammar, and spelling power, along with Abeka for science and social studies. I have no idea what curriculums are even out there. And we did not have the internet in our home till about four or five years ago, so that wasn't really an option, although we did a lot of library trips, um, DVDs, um, VCRs, and that helped. Um, as I previously mentioned, we live on a small family farm, and we raise fruits and vegetables, and we sold those at farmer's market. And for some reason, my kids always flunked plant life. So every year we have to redo that course. And it started in the spring and it lasted till the end of summer. Um, if anybody asks about social interaction, they got all the social interaction they needed just by helping customers at farmer's market. Um, they also became very proficient in addition, subtraction, and counting change back to customers. So I was intrigued by the subject I was asked to speak on today, nurturing family relationships. Um, before we start, I will tell you I am a Bible-believing Christian. Much of what I speak on today is based upon a foundation in Jesus Christ and his authority. Um, science expresses the universe in five terms. Time, force, energy, space, matter. I don't know if you've ever heard of this, but I think it's really cool. Those five components are addressed by the very first sentence of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, time, God, force, created energy, the heavens, space, and the earth matter. Therefore, only the Bible matters. Among God's first creation was the family. Sadly, the relationship between Cain and Abel was not very good, but it is very important to note that the most basic form of government is the family. So what is a family? It's a group of one or more parents, preferably a father and a mother, and their children. As our society turns its back on God's holy book, strange variations of the family begin to exist. But I would like to believe the majority in this room believe the family is best served with both the mother and the father present, realizing that that may not always be the case. To nurture means to care for and to encourage the growth and development of our children. And finally, a relationship is just the state of being connected. So the question is this, how do we encourage our children to connect with each other and to us as parents? I would say this, and I don't mean this in a haughty way, but because we made the sacrifice to educate our children at home, we are already a step ahead of most families when it when trying to achieve relationships with our children and our children with each other. The process of nurturing begins with us. How do our children view our relationship with each other? The Bible says, now these three remain, faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. My husband and I don't always agree. 
However, we made a conscious effort to make sure our children do not see us fight. It's not always achieved, but we've tried. Um, I remember one time as a child witnessing an argument between my parents, and I was really scared. I was convinced they were going to get a divorce. They didn't divorce. Um, I also remember my dad, when he'd come in from the farm to eat lunch, and before going back outside, he'd always take my mom down this hallway and he'd kiss her, but he didn't realize that we would run down and peer through this door and watch him kiss. <laughs> they thought they were doing it in secret, but really, isn't that reassuring to a child to witness that type of relationship between their parents? I think parents that constantly fight or bicker cause anxiety in their children and it teaches them that it is normal to fight. That's hardly nurturing and definitely not good for any relationship. Um, children should see affection between their parents. When my husband and I get into his farm truck, he still opens the door for me and I climb in the driver's side of the truck and I sit next to him, kind of like we're still teenagers in love. A recently married couple told Fred and I that they sit next to each other in their truck, just like us all. <laughs> Isn't that sweet? It warmed my heart. And, you know, my son-in-law calls us the lovebirds. So we need to teach that love to our children. Demonstrate love by showing affection. Don't be afraid to hug your children. And I hug my children and my grandchildren all the time. I'm sure they get tired of it, but I think that's very important. When our children accomplish a task, Praise them. Teach them the importance of saying please and thank you. It's normal for children to fight, but don't let it get out of control. And having six daughters, we experienced a lot of cat fights in our home. Don't be afraid to discipline your children when it's necessary. The Bible speaks of discipline. God disciplines us when we disobey. Why? Because he loves us, it's nurturing, and it's part of our special relationship with him. So some of the things that we did as a family, and I strongly encourage, are the following. Number one, try to eat at least one meal together once a day. Now, I realize this cannot always happen, but try. Families bond or connect at the dinner table. Remember, relationship means the state of being connected. When my daughter was in kindergarten, I told her teacher during our parent-teacher conference that she was learning to write. I explained that when she set the dinner table, she would write all her names on a napkin, and then she'd set the table. And she always decided where we would eat. And the teacher looked at me in amazement, not because my daughter could write our names, but because we were the only family in her classroom that sat down together for a meal. Now, isn't that sad? Imagine how it is some 20 plus years later with the distraction of cell phones and modern technology. You ever go out to eat and see these families eating together and they're all on the phone? Number two, recess is important. It gives you a break. It gives your children a chance just to be children. If the weather permits, get them outside and let them play with each other. Think back to your own childhood and the hours you spent just playing. Myself, being raised on a farm, my siblings and I, we rode bikes, we created the best hay tunnels in our barn, we explored the timber, we played imaginative games, all with each other. We were developing and nurturing relationships that lasted a lifetime. The other day, my grandchildren were visiting our farm. They were tromping around in the mud in one of our fields when my three-year-old grandson came running to the house with a small rock. Grandma, he yelled, we're on an adventure and I found a diamond. Encourage your children to go on adventures. Number three, teach your children to work together. As I mentioned before, we raised vegetables and had a large garden. And one job our children had to do was mulch with grass clippings. A neighbor who, moved, or who mowed several yards would bring a trailer full of grass clippings to our farm much to our children's dismay. The mulching had to be done fast because the grass clippings would ferment quickly, especially if they were slightly damp, and it caused it to heat up, clump up, and stink, you know, green manure. Um, Fred would always supervise this job to make sure it was done right. And my girls still talk about mulching the garden. They even made up a song about this job and about their dad. I can still hear them singing 
this song when they worked. Now, I'm not going to sing it, but I'll tell you the words because I remember them well. It went like this. He's the parent of perfection in his perfected ways. And if something's not done right, he will put up a fight. If there's one thing he hates, he hates it's when things are misplaced because he's the parent of perfection. <laughs> Number four, allow your children to help. Let, uh, let them crack the eggs with baking when you're baking. You know, I do this with my grandkids. Um, you might want to make sure you have a soapy washcloth and a wastebasket close by. Um, have them help with dishes. Have one child wash, one child you know, dry, one child put away. Let them sweep the floor, um, fold and put away their laundry and make their beds. Um, in our case, each of our children had a nickname. Carl's was Bubba, because his sisters couldn't say brother. They just said he's a Bubba. Um, and Sarah's was Squeaks. I have no idea where that came from. But Sarah wanted goats, OK? So we had some friends that raised goats. So we drove over to Illinois to get um, a goat for Sarah. And when they put the goat in our truck, they said, um, to the goat, enjoy your new home, Squeaks. The goat was named, nicknamed the same as Sarah. So we had these goats. And one time, we bought three little goats and decided we were going to put them in our basement. Well, we live in an old farmhouse. So we really don't have a basement. We had a cellar. And these goats were about this, this tall. And we put them in this enclosure, thought everything was fine. And we were upstairs. And pretty soon, we'd hear this. Coming up the steps, and these goats would appear in our laundry room. And we're like, how did they get out? So we'd go back downstairs, get them pinned in again. And this went on about three times. So finally, we went down the steps, peered around the corner. And these goats would start at like the corner of a pen. And they'd run toward the wall. And their four hooves would hit that wall. And they'd ricochet and catapult themselves over this door that we had inside. And they'd be out. And I'm like, the goats are going outside. <laughs> you know, and we had lambs, too, that the children had to take care of. And one time, Carl and Rachel brought this lamb to the house. And that thing was the smallest lamb I had ever seen alive. It, it couldn't have stood more than this. We called it Pee Wee. And he couldn't even stand. So he couldn't nurse. So Rachel decided to nurture this lamb. So she slept in the utility room next to the dryer with this little lamb. And she had her pillow and her blanket. And then she had all these towels. And she would put them in the dryer and warm them up and wrap the lamb around with these towels and feed it through the night. And that little thing lived because of her nurturing. Now teach your children to nurture. Don't be afraid. I'm speaking metaphorically. But don't be afraid to have goats in your basement. Right? If they're going to bring in a little bird or a little bunny rabbit, show them how to nurture you know, those animals. Or it might be a kitten, it might be a dog. That's all part of what we're talking about, that nurturing. Um, number five, play games together. Um, technology is a blessing. Technology is a curse. Put away the cell phones and get out a board game. Our family favorites were USA Trivia, Scrabble, Triominoes, Category, and Sorry. And as our children grew older, they played the noun game. I don't know if you've ever heard of that, but it's a lot of fun. And telephone, Pictionary, that was a blast. Um, in the winter, we always tried to put together at least one puzzle. And during the summer, we would, um, especially on Sunday afternoons, visit parks, state parks. We'd load the van with a grill and a picnic basket, go to these state parks. Um, the kids played kickball, hide and seek. Um, sometimes Fred and I would just relax while the children played on the playground equ equipment. And what wonderful memories, building relationships as we sat around a picnic table, eating grilled hamburgers and potato chips, stopping for ice cream on our way home. Um, we also took family vacations. Some of these involved camping. Camping with seven children under the age of 10. But that was more memories made and more bonding between the ch uh, children solidified. Number six, never have favorites. This really doesn't need any explanation. But having seven children with seven different personalities, I learned that each one needed to be treated differently. 
That didn't mean one was favored over the other. I have personally witnessed parents favoring one child over another. Once that occurs, the relationship between the children is compromised and most likely permanently damaged. And having said all of that, if you would ask my children, did I favor one over the other, they'd probably say yes. But really, I think, um, and I am convinced, that they know that they were loved and cherished all the same. Um, there is this thing that we call the birth order theory. You ever heard of it? Um, it claims that the order a child is born shapes their development and personality. I kind of agree with this theory to a point because understandably, older children, you know, had to help with the younger children. Um, they were given more responsibilities, and especially in our case, because having seven children in 10 years just demanded they helped. Number seven, don't overwhelm your children. And I'll explain this to the best of my ability. If they wish to compete in sports, 4-H, whatever, that's awesome. Uh, learning teamwork, sportsmanship, along with practice, it teaches children lifelong lessons. Um, what I'm speaking about, and I really don't want to offend anybody, but it's this um, traveling competitions, and I don't know if you know anything about that, but I think it robs families of precious time together, and it might not be healthy for your children. My grandson, who is seven, and he weighs all of 50 pounds dripping wet, wrestled for the first time this year. It was a great experience for him, but one of his friends lost five pounds so he could wrestle in a lower weight bracket. And I'm thinking, that's 10% of his body weight. Um, that seemed a little extreme to me. So just be careful when encouraging your children. And not everybody's going to be a Caitlin Clark or a Spencer Petrus. That's just not going to happen. So number eight, make sure your family is attending church regularly. My children had many fond memories of Sunday school, and Sunday mornings meant our family goes to church. Um, pray before meals, read Bible stories to your children. It's so important. Teach your children the Ten Commandments. Have them learn the importance of loving their neighbors. You can visit nursing homes, maybe. I'm not sure how that is with COVID. Just visit the elderly. Um, once in a while, you can have them go through their toys or their clothes and donate to hopefully yours, the Salvation Army, or Goodwill. Demonstrate the importance of just donating to local food banks. Number nine, when the time comes, let your children go. Part of nurturing is allowing your ch child to stand on his or her own two feet. When Carl was 17, he bought a 1971 Dodge Dart. I'm thinking to myself, what is he doing? My grandpa drove a Dodge Dart, and now he's bringing this old car home. Well, that purchase allowed him to eventually develop a tubular suspension business. I remember when he fixed this car up and he took me down the road in this car, I was screaming and holding on to the dash, telling him to slow down, slow down. And he's like, Mom, I'm going 45. But it was so loud, and I'm like, this is not anything like my grandpa's Dodge Dart. But when he tried to turn that car, he figured out the suspension in those old cars were worthless. So he took it home to his shop, tore it apart, developed a new suspension system, put it on the internet, thing went viral, started a business. He even sold those suspensions to Europe, Canada, Australia, New Zealand. New Zealand. It, it was amazing. And it was because we just kind of let them go, let them do their things. They're going to find their niche. Um, Rachel, she wanted to be a nurse. Okay, that's great. I was a nurse. That's a wonderful occupation. So um, I had this minor surgical procedure, and I thought, I'll just let her tag along with me, and she can, you know, witness it and see what she thinks. And when it was all over, she was just kind of ashen, and she said, I'm, I'm not going to be a nurse mom. She's going to handle it. So her journey um, led her to several jobs, and she became a loan officer at the, a bank, and now she's a paraplanner. I think a paraplanner is they plan people's finances, and you know, I'm not really sure. Um, Brenda, she was nanny to two sets of twins. They were one year apart, and once they started school, and she was no longer needed. She became a nanny in Iowa City. 
Then she moved back to Burlington, took a job at a bank. She started as a bank teller and advanced to a mortgage loan officer. So once again, no college, just eventually she found her niche. Rhiannon, she was always my artist. Um, she started at Hy-Vee and she, when she was at Hy-Vee, she received the attention of this young man who was working as a butcher. And it was kind of weird because at one point he sent her this picture and he said, if we have kids, this is what they're going to look like. Now she hadn't even gone out with him and she's like this kind of creepy mom. And, but he was, he was a neighbor's um, child. So we knew him. I thought, oh, whatever. So she ended up um, going to Iowa State University because she thought, I'm going to be an architect. But remember that guy at Hy-Vee? <laughs> he kind of pursued her. She ended up going out with him first date. She said, I'm going to marry that guy. So this is the guy that sent her a picture of what their kids are going to look like. And they do have four kids. doesn't look anything like the picture he sent her. <laughs> So her dream of becoming an architect, you know, just kind of went by the wayside. And, um, you know, one year in college, and she's engaged and starts a family. And uh, she's a stay-at-home mom. But when she had two children, she bought this sewing machine. And I said to her, what are you doing with a sewing machine? I'm going to teach myself how to sew. And I'm like, Brianna, I didn't even teach you how to sew a button on a, a jacket if it fell out. And she said, no, I'm, I, I really am. I'm going to teach myself how to sew. Well, she now has four sewing machines. She started by selling children's clothing at um, Farmer's Market in Des Moines and also online. And then she transformed that business into a fabric shop. So she's doing well just doing, doing that, and yet she's able to stay at home. Uh, Courtney worked at Hy-Vee in Burlington and then in Iowa City. And that's when she shared an apartment with Brenda. She also worked in child care, but she was just kind of unsettled until God led her into a relationship with a wonderful young man, and now she's a content homemaker. Sydney began her career working at a bank, and after passing several exams, she became a personal insurance spe specialist. And Sydney was always my free spirit, and she enjoyed the single life until she met a young man on a blind date, of all things. So she's no longer single. She's in a relationship. <laughs> um, Sarah started at Hy-Vee in the bakery. And I remember after her first day at, on the job, she came to me and she was just crying. And she said, Mom, what have I done? I can't do this. Now, she was my baby. And I, just, I wanted to baby her and say, it's all right. Just help me in the garden. You don't need to work. But I knew that that wasn't nurturing. So I encouraged her. And pretty soon she discovered a love for baking. And after marrying, her husband and her um, purchased a business in Burlington. And she loves to bake. And man, does she bake. Um, our girls lived together in an apartment during their single years. And as parents, it spoke volumes to their close relationship with each other. And now we see them nurturing their own families. And we have this thing called WhatsApp. You guys heard of it? So they all belong to WhatsApp. And it drives Fred crazy, especially at night when we're trying to go to bed. He's like, just shut off the phone because I get like these alerts when they're, and they're always speaking to each other on WhatsApp, you know, bing, bing, you know. And, and you know, one might just say, hey, Henry's not feeling very well. Can you, can you pray for him? And they're, oh, yeah, you know. And it's, it's just kind of this neat connection that they have. Um, so finally, number 10, this is the most important thing, and that is to pray. Pray daily for your family. The family that prays together stays together, and that's so true. And so when we pray, a lot of times I just pray the Lord's Prayer. You know, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Well, what is the most basic form of his kingdom? It's the family. It's his family. It's your family. He entrusted that family to you. So um, our family does come together. We've had trials. We've had triumphs. 
When Brenda and her husband were just one month shy of their first anniversary, Andrew was diagnosed with cancer, and it was in his pancreas, his liver, and his gallbladder. A trial? Yes, absolutely. But we came together. We did a benefit for him. Um, everyone was just so supportive of them. And we prayed for him, and we were just so encouraging. And a triumph occurred because he is now cancer-free. He's been cancer-free for over two years. Um, Rachel delivered twins 17 weeks early. Those little babies weighed one pound, two ounces when they were born. She spent um, six months in Iowa City. Now remember, Rachel was the one that nurtured Pee Wee, the little micro preemie lamb, and now she had preemie twins, micro preemie twins. So she had this little apartment in the Ronald McDonald house, and we traveled to Iowa City, and her siblings were traveled to Iowa City. We spent a lot of time with her, just encouraging her and with those little babies. And they're almost five. Um, they graduated from the children's hospital, and now they're thriving at home. Carl, he was engaged, and two days before that engagement, it, or two days before that marriage, the engagement was broke, two days before. A trial, yes, but he found his soulmate. And I'm going to tell a little story about tri uh, Carl and his soulmate, because I think this is really cool. Um, when my dad was 90, he was reading the newspaper, and he saw um, that this man was celebrating his 90th birthday. And he said, you know, I went to school with him in Danville when I was eight years old. And he got out these old photos, and he found a picture that was over 80 years old of him and this man. And he sent it to him. And they made arrangements to get together. And before that could happen, my dad passed away. And about a year and a half later, Carl meets this girl, starts dating her, brought her to meet my mom. And my mom said, so where do you live? And she said, I live in Biggsville, Illinois. And she said, what's your name? And she said, Rachel, or Kendra Kelly. And mom said, do you know Roger Kelly? And she said, that's my grandpa. That was the man in the picture. That's kind of a cool story. You just, sometimes you have to let God be God. I remember when that engagement was canceled and it was two days before the wedding and I, I had to call people and tell them, and it was kind of embarrassing. You know, Carl's not gonna get married. Don't come to the wedding. Nobody's gonna be at church. And it was strange because the encouragement I got from people. If this is not supposed to be, it's so good that it's canceled now and not six months after they were married. So um, I can remember we all went bowling like the next day after his wedding and nobody, or the wedding that was supposed to be, nobody said a word. We were just together, just encouraging each other by our presence. So sometimes that's what you have to do. You have to just be there. Um, as a family, you know, we endured financial hardships of raising seven children on a small farm, but we worked together, especially in the garden, and we made it. And I think my husband and I succeeded in nurturing our family, and it shows in their relationship with each other. We are most blessed, and all glory goes to Jesus Christ. So that's it. And if you have any questions, um, you know, I'd be glad to answer questions. And I also had some written out. I don't know if Olivia had those. So. Okay, well, thank you very much. This was a privilege. And I'm going to let you do this thing. I, well, I'll take it off. But. Okay. Well, thank you so much. That was fantastic. I loved hearing all the stories and oh, the yeah. connections. And it's encouraging to hear about relationships and how... You know, they've blossomed over the years and continue to stay close. Um, okay, so real quick, for next month, we are going to be meeting on May 5th. Um, is that three weeks? Three weeks. Three weeks. So um, we have Kim Brennan coming. So she wrote, actually Laura has a book. She wrote the book, Large Family Logistics. And she's actually coming to speak. Um, Olivia got a hold of her. And um, 
she will be coming down for that. So we do um, help kind of offset pay for mileage and stuff. If anyone is willing to pitch in for that, that would be fantastic. Um, but don't feel obligated in any way. Don't let it stop you from coming. If you can't, that's perfectly fine. Um, you can either give money to me today, or Lydia said you can reach out to her and coordinate that way. So, um, but if we can do that beforehand, so we figure out how much, make sure it's been covered before she gets to it. Great. So, um, I think that's all my little tips and plans for future stuff. I don't know anything past that. <laughs> uh, I think things are still in the works. So, thank you guys for coming. Shut this off, and if you didn't grab the discussion questions, you can go do that. Um, I don't know how many copies there were, but we can have our discussion.